Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, I would like to lay some needed essential groundwork for the upcoming talks on inhibitors of a very important glutamine channel named SLC7A11. And before we can actually get to that discussion, I'd like to talk about an essential cellular process called ferroptosis. So let's get into it. So this paper is titled Ferroptosis and Cancer Therapy, a Novel Approach to Reversing Drug Resistance. And it says here that ferroptosis is an intracellular iron-dependent form of cell death that is distinct from apoptosis, necrosis, and autophagy. Extensive studies suggest that ferroptosis plays a pivotal role in tumor suppression, thus providing new opportunities for cancer therapy. And it says later that the development of resistance to cancer therapy remains a major challenge. A number of preclinical and clinical studies have focused on overcoming drug resistance. Intriguingly, ferroptosis has been correlated with cancer therapy resistance and inducing ferroptosis has been demonstrated to reverse drug resistance. Herein, we provide a detailed description of the mechanisms of ferroptosis and the therapeutic role of regulating ferroptosis and reversing the resistance of cancer to common therapies such as chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. We discuss the prospect and challenge of regulating ferroptosis as a therapeutic strategy for reversing cancer therapy resistance and expect that our review could provide some references for further studies. So this is a graphical representation of the three major pathways or processes that are involved in ferroptosis. And classically, it's involving heavily this glutamine and cysteine transporter, the SLC7A11 glutamine cysteine antiporter, which allows for the biosynthesis of the glutathione necessary to protect against reactive oxygen species and to protect against ferroptosis. It also involves transferrin and the uptake of iron into cells and the protection of iron by cells to prevent iron's oxidation. And lastly, it requires involvement of fatty acids, such as polyunsaturated fatty acids as seen here. And when iron is oxidized and combined with these polyunsaturated fatty acids, which have the ability to oxidize pretty easily due to points of unsaturation, that's when this ferroptosis can kick off and lead to another form of cell death that can be utilized to kill cancer cells. And when ferroptosis is activated, it inhibits chemotherapy resistance. And when ferroptosis is not active, then chemotherapy resistance is more likely to be present. I know that a lot of you probably have read Jane McClellan's book, Starving Cancer and Killing It with Ferroptosis. And that was probably your introduction to the subject of ferroptosis. But what is happening is that iron can be utilized as a weapon, essentially. Iron is a very highly oxidizable metal that your body takes great care of to protect and keep safe against oxidative stress. So one of the major strategies that cancer cells have is that it highly upregulates the endogenous NRF2 antioxidant response elements and due to the huge amount of glutamine that is uptaked into cells and glucose that is shuttling glucose 6-phosphate into the PPP to make NADPH, we have kind of a perfect storm to maximize glutathione production within cancer cells, which makes them fairly impervious to oxidative therapies. So therefore, this ferroptosis concept is an important part of the strategy employed by both conventional and unconventional oncologists. And this paper is more of a gestalt about the emerging important roles of these amino acid transporters in the therapeutic management of cancer, both from a conventional and non-conventional perspective. And this paper is titled Amino Acid Transporters Within the Solute Carrier Superfamily, Underappreciated Proteins and Novel Opportunities for Cancer Therapy. And the major conclusions are basically that amino acid transporters by the SLCs play a critical role in tumor progression. To exert their functions, SLCs mediate metabolic rewiring, regulate the maintenance of redox balance, affect main oncogenic pathways, regulate amino acid bioavailability within the tumor microenvironment, 
and alter the sensitivity of cancer cells to therapeutics. However, different therapeutic methods that prevent the function of SLCs were able to inhibit tumor progression. This comprehensive review provides insights into the rapidly evolving area of cancer biology by focusing on amino acids and their transporters within the SLC family. So some of these things we've talked about already, quercetin, berberine, curcumin, et cetera. And what I'm trying to set up here is the next class of these SLC proteins, this SLC7A11, which is something that we have not talked about, which is something that if you looked at prior slides such as this, you would think that there are only basically drugs that can affect these pathways, when in which that is far from the truth. There are probably more known inhibitors of the SLC711 than any of the other ones we talked about in the past. And given papers with titles such as this, SLC7A11, the Achilles heel of tumor, question mark, it gives me a lot of hope to think that there are so many different natural and nutraceutical inhibitors of this important glutamine cysteine antiporter. And what it says here in this paper is that the non Naturetic dependent glutamate cysteine inverse transporter system is composed of two protein subunits, SLC7A11 and SLC3A2, with the SLC7A11 serving as the primary functional component responsible for cysteine uptake and glutathione biosynthesis. SLC7A11 is implicated in tumor development through the regulation of redox homeostasis, amino acid metabolism, modulation of immune function and induction of programmed cell death, among other processes relevant to tumor genesis. In this paper, we summarize the structure and biological functions of SLC7A11 and discuss its potential role in tumor therapy, which provides a new direction for precision and personalized treatment of tumors. So simply put, this is removing glutamine from the cell while at the same time bringing in cysteine. And cysteine plus glutamine plus glycine equals glutathione. So all three of these amino acids are critically important, but this transporter, given its role in both glutamine and glutathione production directly, seems to hold special importance for the metabolic approach to cancer. And essentially what they found is that given its critical role in the production of glutathione, specifically the aberrant excess glutathione that's produced by cancer cells as a way to raise its shields against oxidative therapies, et cetera, is its critical importance in managing redox biochemistry. And we have touched on redox chemistry. Some of you may have heard of redox chemistry, and I'd like to have a whole series later down the line about mitochondrial redox. But what these are, are oxidation reduction reactions that can lead to the production, even under normal circumstances, of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. And as we've talked about in prior videos, when it comes to mitochondrial function, there is a retrograde signaling that goes on between the mitochondrial electron transport chain and the mitochondria to the nucleus to upregulate the necessary antioxidant genes and components to modulate redox chemistry. So what cancer is doing essentially is it's hijacking this system for its own benefit and as a way to protect itself from its own redox chemistry that's going on, but also from oxidative therapies. And those could be chemotherapy, but that could also be radiation therapy. That could be IV vitamin C in high doses. That could be hyperbaric oxygen, among other things that can lead to excess reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species and ferroptosis that can selectively kill cancer cells. But suffice to say, this SLC7A11 is an important target for our purposes on this mission. And they have seen here that when SLCA711 is expressed highly, then these cancer cells are ferroptosis resistant because they're able to produce a bunch more glutathione and protect themselves against lipid peroxidation and ultimately ferroptosis. But if it's low, they're more sensitive to ferroptosis, which leaves open an important strategy that can be used against them. So this is where metabolic therapy really shines because as you can see here, not only does glutathione need the necessary glutamine and cysteine in order to create glutathione, the very powerful antioxidant to protect itself against ferroptosis and oxidative therapies, 
but it also requires NAD pH in order for this reaction to be recycled and for the cell to be able to continue to protect itself. And we know from talking about glycolysis and the PPP in prior videos that the PPP or the pentose phosphate pathway is the major mechanism in which cancer cells and normal cells get NADPH. And so when we put someone on a ketogenic diet or we have them fast or we use inhibitors of glucose uptake, glucose utilization, or even PPP inhibitors through the blockade of G6PD, which we'll talk about in the future, we are shutting down the cancer cell's ability to make NADPH in sufficient quantities to recycle glutathione. And when we're also blocking glutamine through various strategies, then we're able to shut down the cysteine and glutamine utilization by cancer cells. So we have now blocked the raw substrates necessary to build glutathione to begin with. So this is how the program that Seafried has laid out in the foundations of metabolic therapy comes together in a very beautiful synergy. And that is highlighted really well in this particular graphic, because in this graphic, what they're doing is they're starving the cancer cells of glucose. You, they're basically putting it on a ketogenic diet or a fasting type diet, or they're using medications or supplements to block glucose uptake and utilization. So now, as you can see here, glucose 6-phosphate now cannot participate in the PPP. You have decreases in NADPH, which is necessary for the recycling of glutathione, and the cells will uptake still because we're not blocking glutamine in this particular strategic methodology. And cysteine and glutamine are still being uptaked into the cell. And believe it or not, there's actually another form of cell death called disulfide apoptosis, where instead of being killed by oxidative stress or iron excesses, there's actually a stressor with the excess utilization of cysteine and sulfur containing amino acids, interesting enough by itself. However, if you give the cancer cells adequate amounts of glucose in addition to the glutamine necessary, then the system works as it's supposed to within a cancer cell. There's plenty of NADPH made through the PPP, and there's plenty of cysteine and glutamine available for cancer cells to use. So therefore, these cancer cells are able to survive. Pretty amazing. I'm going to end this particular video on the conclusions found in that amazing paper. And it says SLC7A11 as the bioactive subunit of the amino acid transporter on cell membranes plays a wide range of biologic functions and organisms. The regulation of SLC7A11 is affected by multiple dimensions and also abnormal regulation of SLC711 leads to malignant tumors related to proliferation, invasion, metastases, and drug resistance. Given that SLC7A11 is often aberrantly expressed in, by tissues and tumors, it is expected to be an important biomarker for the diagnosis and prognosis of a wide range of cancers or tumors. SLC7A11 presents itself as a viable target for tumor therapy with two primary strategies currently under consideration. The first involves the development of direct inhibitors targeting SLC7A11 to impede cysteine uptake in cancer cells, therefore diminishing intracellular glutathione levels and inducing cancer cell ferroptosis. The second strategy entails the utilization of inhibitors targeting glucose, transporter proteins, or glutaminase. Remember, that's the enzyme that Don specifically blocks in the treatment of tumors overexpressing SLC7A11. This approach capitalizes on the heightened vulnerability of SLC7A11 overexpressing tumors to glucose and glutamine deprivation, aka metabolic therapy, ultimately leading to tumor cell death. I think that that's probably a good place to end on. So I think what we can take away from this video is that there is a process of cell death that is novel, that is aside from necrosis or the non-programmed cell death or programmed cell death apoptosis. And that process is called ferroptosis, the utilization of iron as a weapon, essentially. And this is a hot topic right now, even within the conventional medical research, because they're seeing this as a way to reverse chemotherapy resistance. And immunotherapy resistance and radiotherapy or radiation resistance. So there is a lot of research dedicated to 
this SLC 7A11 glutamine cysteine antiporter, even within conventional medicine. And what I think is really cool about this is that it's starting to seemingly sway the opinions of even conventional research showing the importance of glucose and glutamine in the maintenance of cancer cells survival. And this is exactly why mitochondrial metabolic therapy as originated by Dr. Warburg, probably back in the 1930s and 40s, and the torch has been passed to Dr. Thomas Seafried up at Boston College. This is why he is beating the drum so hard about the metabolic approach to cancer, because it has such an important potential in the management of this horrible disease that is plaguing us in the United States, but all over the world. If you have anybody in your life who could utilize this information, please share it with them. If you like the video, please like it. If you're not a subscriber, please consider subscribing. And until next time.